Welcome to the Rachel and Cassandra Show. Before we begin, our disclaimer. Hey, don't forget, Rachel and Cassandra are not attorneys or financial advisors. Sometimes what they say may sound like legal or financial advice, but it's not. All right, perfect. Welcome, everybody. (laughs) Hello. Hello. Oh, no, that's a Seinfeld episode. I won't squish my belly button to make it talk. Hello. And this is how we open the episode about EMDs, which is... It's always so graceful. Not to be confused with EDM, which I would way rather talk about. Um, But for those who may not know, Cassandra, what is EMD? Earnest money deposit. What? What is that? It's kind of like money you... Give right before you go under contract to to kind of reserve the house and make sure the seller takes it off the market. And then I can use that money to lower, right, as part of closing costs or as part of the down payment under yes. certain circumstances. Also known as good faith money or hand money, walking around money. No, those are different. That's mad money. Remember That's mad, mad money? money. It's mad money. I wish yes. I had, I had a 10 up here earlier. I was going to wave it, but gone. <laughs> Your secret bra money. I don't have a bra on, but yes. Uh, you remember last week was like the top the episode. episode. Yeah. So now we've got a theme. Anyway, let's get to the topic at hand. Quite. Earnest money. Why is it important? Let me start by explaining that earnest money is a custom And in our state, it is customary for a buyer to offer money as good faith that they intend to perform on a contract in exchange for the seller taking the property off the market while they do their due diligence and all the other bullshit that a buyer has to do in order to actually buy a home. So is it like bribery and they just give it to the seller and the seller takes it and, and, and then the borrower, like what does it have to do with anything, Rachel? Funny. You should ask customarily, Cassandra, the earnest money is held by the buyer's brokerage or the title company who's handling the closing. And so the seller doesn't get it. The seller doesn't get it. So it's contrary to popular belief. The buyer does not write a check directly to the seller. It's held in something called an escrow account. Do you know what escrow means? (laughs) I want one of those videos like the Constitution. What's a bill? That's right. Yes, of course. Of course I know what an escrow account is. Yes. Escrow account is just a holding account that is uh, not allowed to be commingled with any other funds from a business. It's for a specific purpose. It can't make money. It can't be borrowed against. It can't be invested against or with. It is literally like a neutral bucket. And that money gets held in a neutral it's not bucket. Mad money. It's not or mad money. money. It's not hand money. It is <laughs> earnest money. Mm-hmm. So there's a weird lag. Okay, so it's really the buyer writes. Okay, hold on. Say again. So the buyer writes a check out to the title company. Yes. Or the buyer's brokerage. And and it's called an earnest money deposit check and it's held in an escrow account. Yes. So it's kind of put to the side. Correct. And how much do they customarily write that for? Okay. So that is very market driven. It's really funny. In the, in the beginning of my career, people were writing earnest money for 500 or 700 or a thousand dollars. And now the baseline that you'd be uh, a laughing stock if you didn't start at 1% and then go up from there. Earnest money also serves the purchase, purchase price? price. Yes. Earnest money also serves as a security feeling representation of the purchaser's ability to perform. It, it's almost like a signal, a social signal of their financial health strength. Yeah. It's, it's funny. It's so what happens with earnest money is the contract it's governed by the contract and in my contract customarily without modifications, because sometimes we change shit to win bids, but customarily the earnest money sits in escrow 
until closing and is applied to the purchaser's closing costs if the deal is consummated. However, if the contract allows for the buyer to walk away because they're not satisfied with the inspection, then the buyer and seller have to sign a release of escrow, a release of the earnest money. So I'm like using all of these words to say that you get your money back. Nobody automatically gets their money back though. And a really common misconception. And I hear realtors doing this all the time, all the time, often enough that it makes me nervous. They say, well, if you're not happy with the inspection, you get your money back. And that's where they stop. The reality is if you're not happy with the inspection, the contract dictates that you should get your earnest money back, but you don't actually get your earnest money until the buyer and seller both sign off on agreeing that that's what happened and that you get your money back. And sometimes you have a client who's butthurt that you don't want their house anymore, or they think you were playing some game, even though you're inside of your option period, and they won't sign the form. And sometimes it's been my client that won't sign the form. And if they won't sign the fucking form, you don't get your money back until you can come to an agreement. So my advice to my buyer clients is never write an earnest check that you are not okay being without that money for a little while because it's an actual check that actually gets cashed and deposited into an account and then is governed by paperwork. And until the paperwork can be put in place for it to go somewhere, it sits in escrow. So it just in, it it has the ability to sit and kind of hang out until everything's resolved. Yes. Okay. So we, Cassandra and I have actually had some interesting situations where we've had to remove earnest money from a purchase agreement, which is really yes. weird. Um, do you, it's not I feel weird like for me. But- no. It, it's it's atypical. When I say weird in this instance, I mean it's atypical for someone for money to be taken out of a contract. And it's funny when it has to happen because if you're a buyer and you've got ten grand and you write a ten thousand dollar earnest check, and then the paperwork lines up in such a way that Cassandra steps in and says we can't use that money, we then have to extract it back out of the contract in order to close with a mortgage. Yes. So with a mortgage, I have to paper trail everything. So if you wrote a $10,000 check and you want that $10,000 as to, for me to see it and use it and give you credit for it, right? Mm -hmm. I have to paper trail it. I need a copy of the earnest money check. I need a proof of receipt from the title company. I need proof of the cash check, proof it's cleared your account, something. There's various ways and different mortgage types dictate which ones I can use, but I have to follow the money. If I can't follow the money, I can't can't use the money. It didn't doesn't exist. You might so, as well have paid them in fucking fairy dust. It does, I, it's fake. I have me. had one of the really common situations is a couple, let's say the the Female is buying the house, male, female couple, females buying the house, male writes the check for the earnest money. They have no joint accounts that money. Do, so if this $10,000 is showing up as part of the contract and Cassandra does not see $10,000 trackable out of the purchaser's proof of funds, like you said, that might as well have just been fairy dust. It doesn't yes. count. And I go to great, great lengths to try to, um, do everything I can to validate the money and use it, use that earnest money deposit. And if I can't, as a loan officer, I don't want to spook the seller or the seller's agent. So I wait until it's, it might be shitty, a bad decision, but I wait till we're basically done. And that's my only remaining condition. And I just need an addendum. We're extracting that. Yes. Like, Hey, by the way, I don't want to freak you out. We're done, but I can't source the money that was used for the earnest money, can we back it out? And and the realtor reactions are one of two. Those who have been in, um, it doesn't matter how long somebody has been in business, okay? So it's not, I've been in, because I've heard, I've been in this business 30 years. I've never had to do this. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, I do it, like, okay, that's weird. I do it like every two months. Couple you know, times this a year. fucker used cash. I can't source cash or, yeah. 
Um, or I get like, oh, no problem. Okay. Yep. We'll get that sent over. Like it's usually one of those two. Which it is handled with just a piece of paper because they clearly have I the always, money. Yeah. It's stupid. I always get my way, which sounds like I always win, but like literally I'm not going to ask until I know that everything is done. The appraisal's back. We have insurance. I have enough money sourced without needing that there it is. earnest money deposit check. I, I know that if I just need one piece of paper, removing it from the contract, we're done. So if a lender is calling you, asking you, let's hope they're in the same, like, They've vetted everything and you, you know, we're not trying to screw the seller over. Right. Cause I don't want a seller to get spooked. Right. And it feels weird too early in the yeah. game to back earnest yeah. money out. That's the buyer's skin in the game. And, you know, I think we forgot to cover this. If the deal falls apart, let's say the buyer gets through the inspection, through the appraisal, the day before closing, they radically decide they're just moving to Bora Bora. They can't do these Michigan winters anymore. Peace out, Girl Scout. I'm not buying this freaking house. Well, that is a breach of contract. And that earnest money is the seller's recourse for that violation. So they lost all that time on the market. Yeah. I was going to say, you have noted time on market, like getting relisted. Generally, people go, what's wrong with the house? Why did the deal fall apart, even if it's not the sellers? And it can cost the seller money in the long run. It can. That buyer psychology is the most important thing that has to be managed to when you're listing a property. That's literally all it is. You are manipulating the psychology of the buying public as best as you can. Not, you know, not in a fraudulent, like malicious way, but you know, you want to, I'm kind of already way down a rabbit trail in my brain here, but um, well, so that you're doing the same thing it's marketing when you're you're giving a large EMD. So if somebody is giving a so I've seen you right, and I'm not trying to like do it blow all your secrets out, but you I are very them good at writing a five thousand dollar EMD and a five thousand dollar second EMD post inspection to say like I'll give you five grand now, give me and you like give me seven days to inspect it, and then we'll give you another five grand. So it's a large amount of money, which if I can source it covers, you know, uh, all the closing costs and then some of the down payment, but yes. that's a double. So in that case, I would have to source two, yeah. but that is psychology to 100%. the seller. Cause in their mind, they're seeing a $10,000 EMD. Absolutely. My buyer's only risking five while they figure out if this house is yeah, actually yeah. going to be the one that they buy. And that's a good way for the buyer to not have so much of their money tied up yes, all at the same time. And always comes back to, because it can't be released unless everybody agrees. And everybody starts a deal most of the time with the best of intentions. And when things do, and they don't always go wrong. In fact, it's really, really rare that shit goes sideways, but it's when shit goes sideways that you have to know exactly how things are going to play out. Like you have to know the parameters within which things have to happen. So we have one and I, I stepped back because I don't know. And I felt like I was actually polluting it. We have a file where it's not the earnest money deposit, but we had some repair money that needed to be released by the seller. Did the seller ever release the money for the repairs that the buyer did? No. And here's where it gets really fucked up. So going into the deal, we had an agreement that, X amount of money would be set aside for X, Y, Z. And once X, Y, Z is completed, the funds would be released to party A. So all the things happened that needed to happen. And the title company escrow hold agreement says, hey, we see that your contract requires this money to be set aside. We're going to hold it. And once the things are done, everybody sign this piece of paper and we will release the funds that were already agreed to go to party A we'll release the funds to party A and party B somewhere between closing and the document needing to be signed decided that party A can go F themselves and they're not signing shit. Right. The money has not been released. It will not get released. Ultimately it will be allocated to the state. You know, when you see those uh, call and find out if state of Michigan has your money call now. That is, yeah, there's a website for that. There is a, there is a website for that. 
Oh yeah. Um, that's where sometimes where that money comes from. Like the title con- company isn't obligated to hold it forever. Some title companies will uh, eat away at it. They'll be like, we'll do this for six months. And if you guys don't figure your shit out, we're taking 30 bucks a month out of this sucker until it's depleted. I think that's more of a fair way to handle it, but that's just me. Cause I get irritated when people won't do what they already said they were going to do because they're it's really annoying. bitter. It is annoying. But like but the, the agreement earth, so was we, made, we gave that dedicated, ag- sorry, on this happening. Yeah. I was going to say like, that was the agreement and that's kind of how an earnest money deposit is written. This was a repair escrow, but it's the same principle applies. The money would go into the same account and the terms of the contract and everybody has to agree to release it. So it either gets released and I get to use it if I can source it, right? If everything goes well. And what she means is if your closing costs, including down payment, are $20,000 and you already have handed over a $10,000 earnest deposit that can be sourced, you now only need to bring 10 grand to the table. Right. Yeah. So it's just like I can actually use that money. Did you know one of my favorite things to do with well-qualified buyers is to not source the earnest money deposit? Why? Because it's fucking less paperwork. I hate paperwork. So you on purpose don't source it so you can pull it out of the contract at the end? No, no, no. So oh, no. what I do is say there's twenty thousand dollars due. Say they have forty thousand dollars in their account. Oh, you I just will never ask circumvent I just it and get them a check go, at closing. No, no. I just go, okay, you have forty thousand. You wrote a ten thousand EMD, right? And we yeah. needed twenty. Doesn't matter. Say you have a hundred grand in your account and you need I need twenty of it. You wrote a ten thousand EMD. All I'm going to do is you have a hundred grand. I'm going to say you have 90. I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't even need to see it clear your account. Cause you have more than enough for it to clear your account. So it's are, called backing it out, so, back it but, out. But you're talking about backing it out, not of, of the contract. Okay. That, so, right. so if you have that kind of like fiscal security, yeah, then the paperwork. So the paperwork matters if you're running low on funds. Oh yes. Oh, that, that is in, when it, that gets, makes total sense. Most of, I will say the vast majority of buyers I see from a specific realtor I know, I don't have to source the EMD. I don't have to go get a copy of the check. I don't need it updated bank statements to see it come out of their account. I don't care because you have more than enough to cover it, right? You have more than enough to cover it. So I just go, okay, they have that money for sure and extra. So I'll just do a mental math to their money. If you have somebody who's average balance is $6,000 and they're stroking a $10,000 EMD, you need to see that money that came from uh, with a gift letter from their mother or something, some way to and find sometimes that. Sometimes the donor's account too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, that's my paperwork. So, and I do tell people like, if you're not taking it out of your check, like where, where's the money coming from? I had one that came from a trust and then I had a gift from mom and I had a different trust distribution all on the same I had to do three, two gifts and then a trust distribution and get trust documents. And on the same deal, it was a lot. It was a lot. Yes. Same deal. So Mm -hmm. one other thing I want to make sure I get in here for anybody who's thinking about buying a house, or if you're a newer agent helping your buyer, if you're in a competitive situation, a strong EMD can make your offer. And we did kind of touch on this about the manipulating the feelings of the buyer, but you can also manipulate the feelings of the seller when you're competing, all other things being equal. If party A is offering you $400,000 for your house, conventional mortgage, 20% down, and they're giving you a thousand dollars EMD, that's a thousand dollar recourse. If you bail, it's easy to walk away for from a thousand dollars in that price range. I'm not saying a thousand dollars isn't a lot of money, but if your second offer is identical with a $10,000 EMD or a $20,000 EMD, if person B defaults, that seller has a legitimate claim on that money. So, I mean, which risk are you going to take? B, one, they're less likely to just flake out and walk away because they've got freaking 20 grand on the line. Also, I don't use this very often, but I always have conversations with my buyers about making your EMD non-refundable. It's very risky and not, I mean, it's 0.0001% of the time that I've actually used it, 
but it's not my job to decide which tools the buyer can use in their offer. And you absolutely can say, yeah. And a non-refundable EMD is saying, if this deal doesn't close for any reason, even if it fails inspection, I get fired from my job and can't get my mortgage. I fucking die on my way to the closing table. Seller gets the EMD, but good luck getting that paper signed if I'm dead. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, so you said you would like to let people know that the EMD can be used to win you a bit. It right. Yes, Manipulate absolutely. the seller. Yes. So I would also like to say that the EMD don't take cash for an EMD. Don't nope. use cash for an EMD. Don't take cash out of your safe and turn it into a cashier's check. I cannot paper trail it. Act like you need a paper trail. You need documents. Um, I'm going to say this, even though it sounds really old. If you have a personal check and you got to be over 40 to have a personal checkbook, that's literally the easiest thing. It tells me the check number, your name's on it, the bank's on it, the account number's on it, cashier's <gasps> check, not maybe the pe- same. Yeah, maybe people don't know this. You can walk <sighs> into your bank and ask for a temporary check or a counter check, and they will print you one on the spot that you can then fill out and take to the title company and have that as your EMD. It's totally yeah, paper so- trailed. I would also just like to point out if you're doing like an ACH transfer, because I know that's becoming popular. Um, those are sometimes a little tricky because your charges say a thousand or two thousand dollars. The fees usually sometimes more. There's like a three fifty fee. I have to write a letter to explain what? the difference. There's a fee for an me. ACH. There's it's also a bill a pay. Fee. No, it's a no, bill no. pay. Usually you do it on the other end. It's usually on the other end and it's usually from the title company or from the real estate broker to receive an ACH. They charge you. Okay. I can't even tell you the amount of stupid fees I have to write letters for. Can I? $25 cashier's check fee. The check was a thousand, but I took out a thousand twenty five. This is another episode we can do because I have been going to battle about wire fees and ACH fees and trying to figure out like... I just can't tell you the level of frustration that I also have around these stupid money fees. Can I, can we talk about Venmo and how impossible it is to get any usable statement from fucking Venmo transferring? Oh, I need transferred money in, transferred money out. There's no like statement for Venmo. I mean, I can cobble one together, but it's you have to invent brutal. It. Yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. I have so, to invent it and like, let's summarize like that. our EMD chat no venmo no cash have it personal traceable check is best. personal check is best it's a representation of you as a fiscally sound buyer right wrong or indifferent it's just the reality of the situation so it can help you win or lose a deal all other things being equal yeah and uh yeah make it don't make the mistake that you will ever see it again automatically It all has to be, we still have to paper trail the hell out of it to make it go anywhere. Yeah, to use it or make it move. That's right. All right, thanks for joining us. Short and sweet. Bye. The info given is current as of this recording, but remember, the market changes and real estate is hyper-local.